the rest of the annotations that we're going to look at now are not about validation, but about mapping to the database. So for example, we're going to impact the column names or the column type or the table name in the table. We can do concurrency checking. We can define a complex type in the model and make sure that code first understands how that should be set up in the database. We're also going to look at some relationship annotations. Database generated and not mapped are also very specific to how the model maps to the database. So we'll start with column and table. The table and column data annotations are used to specify the names of the objects that the entity and properties map to in the database. So by default, the class alias is expected to map to a table with a plural of that name. And this is set up for English, so that will be aliases and tweet will be tweets. And then all of the properties by default will, will expect to map to fields of the same exact name as the properties. So we can use table and alias to change that. And they also provide a few other features. I'll start with alias and I will modify the table name. Now the name is the default attribute for the table annotation. So I don't have to specify that that's what I'm changing. I can just put the name in there. And let me call that authors. We've been using that a little bit. The one other attribute that you have available in the table annotation is to change the schema. Now, since that's not the default attribute, I have to say schema equals, and I know I happen to have a schema in there called guest, so I'll use that one. I think it's lowercase too. So that's what I'm doing with the table annotation, and those are the only two things that you can affect. The column property has three attributes, and like table, name is the default. So I'll put the column property on date time, and I'll just use all three right here. So I'll set column, and then the first thing I can put in there by default without having to specify the attribute name is the name of the column. So I'll say that the date time column is really called date started in the database. So this could be if I'm mapping to a database that already existed, or I just have a specific scenario where I know that in my application domain, I really want to use the word create date, but we have different naming conventions in the database, and I'm required to use date started in the database. One of the other attributes is order, and what that does is specify what order the column is in in the table. So do I want it to be the third column or the fourth column or the first column? And it's a zero-based order number. So I'll say let's make order be the second column and since it's zero-based that would be one. Now I was originally a little confused by order because I thought that the rest of the columns were starting as zero, one, two, etc. But they aren't. The default value is the maximum value of int32 which is two billion something. 2.1 billion or something like that. So if I just set the order of one of these columns to any integer less than that max, it will appear before the other columns. So I want start date to be the second column and the primary key to be the first. That means I'll set start date to one and then I'll go back to author key and set it to zero. And I'll leave the rest of them at the default 2.1 billion. And then the last attribute is type name. And here I can use a database type. So this would be specific to the database that I'm working in. So I'm in SQL Server. And I want to say, well, for this property, I'm actually using SQL Server 2008. And I want to take advantage of the new date field, which is just date, not date with time attached. So I can say date here. Now I need to just go back and set that column order on the author key and set that to zero, like I said. So I've already got key there, and I add column and order equals zero. And remember, I also made changes to table. So now I'll go ahead and run the application again, which, thanks to the database initializer, will drop and recreate the database with this new schema, as well as seed it for me. So again, now that I'm here, I know that the database initialization worked. I've refreshed my database, and already I can see that the aliases table is now called authors. And remember, I changed the schema to use the guest schema. So now we can see the effect of that. 
Now the table is guest.authors. In this case, I'm creating the database, but this is also a really useful thing to be able to do when you're mapping to an existing database. Now let's take a look at the columns. And there's author key still in the first position and date started in the second position with everything following. So if I had just said date started should be order equals one, and I didn't change anything else, that would be the very first one because all of the rest of them would have the order number 2.1 billion something. <laughs> or should I just say int 32 max. So also notice that date started does have the new name and it's a date type now, not a date time. So all of the changes I made with column, so there are all the changes I made using the column attribute. Now it's important to also see how this affects the application, especially with a date. So I'll create a new alias again. Now notice that the create date was already populated. I didn't just type that in. I modified my code to, to just put in system.datetime.now. So I don't just have a date, I have a date and a time. And you might think that that's going to be a problem when I try to save this. So I'll go ahead and create and I step through and apparently the model is valid so that looks good and I'll run it the rest of the way through and you can see what happened was that the time was truncated and now I just got 6-9-2011 so that's something also important to know if you want that time in there you're not going to get any warning flags that that's getting chopped off